Good morning, everyone. You're listening to The Sci-Files, an exposure segment featuring Michigan State University student research. We're your co-hosts, Chelsea Boudou and Daniel Puentes. Hey, everyone. Today we're here with Sayed Mohamed Razoum. Sayed, can you please introduce yourself for us? Hello, my name is Sayed Mohamed Reza Haydari, third year PhD student in Civil and Environmental Engineering Department, working on sustainable nanotechnology. Thanks for that introduction. Could you elaborate a little bit more on your work with nanotechnology? Yes, I'm working on nanotechnology because uh, in the last few years, nanotechnology has started growing up and scaling up. So we need to look at the uh, environmental problem and environmental impact of nanotechnology in the next f- in the future in the next few years uh, specifically because uh, for producing materials we conventionally select the uh, right and proper materials based on the efficiency of those materials but for the nanoparticles the problem is we need large amount of those materials during the process. So if we don't care about the environmental impact, we will increase the problem. You said that you're working on sustainable nanotechnology. How do you check the sustainability of it? Yeah, that's a very good question. Sustainable uh, can be regarding to uh, social science, to the economy, and also environment. So I'm looking at process of producing nanoparticles in three aspects. Social from social science as aspect from the engineering, which is environmental engineering, and also the economy. So we combine these three and consider these three parameters to uh, determine if a process is sustainable. When people hear nanoparticles, they think of these really small little particles that are traveling in three-dimensional space. I'm having a hard time understanding why something so small would have a an impact in the environment in the first place. How does that impact even occur? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the problem is exactly that they are very small. So we can look at this problem from two uh, aspects. The first aspect is uh, these are very small and they can pass through the body of the people. They can pass through any... Uh, membranes, any membranes, I mean uh, like animal membranes, uh, so they can cause toxicity or they can cause a hazardous, effect, hazardous effects on the uh, society. The second part is uh, when we are looking at the nanopart- for producing these uh, small nanoparticles, we need a large amount of materials. For example, we, they are very small for one kilogram of uh, a carbon, we need uh, 1,000 kilogram of a solvent. But for producing one kilogram of nanocarbon, we need million kilogram of uh, that solvent. So this the process is more important than uh, the final product. So that's why, as environmental engineers, we are focusing on the process more than the product. Interesting. That makes a lot of sense to me that it would be harder and take a lot more resources to try and produce these very small particles. Does your research focus on a specific nanoparticle? Yes, I'm focusing on the fullerenes, which is, uh, which is the nanocarbons, uh, very uh, small uh, particles that, can, that can, you can find more in a space than in on Earth. But in a specific uh, circumstance, we can produce it in a lab. And in the last few years, like in the last 20 years, we produced it in a lab uh, for different applications. So I'm mostly focused on the fullerenes as a nano-scale carbon. You had mentioned that fullerenes are found in the air and that they're also in a ring-like shape. I would like to get a better idea of how they look, please, but I'm also wondering, how do you make fullerenes in the lab? Yes, fullerenes is more look like a soccer ball, so you can find it anywhere in a, in a nature, but mostly they produce uh, between the stars in the uh, space. But in the lab, we are producing it during the combustion process, which means we burn some hydrocarbons like toluene uh, at a very high temperature, around 2,000 degrees of Celsius, and at a vacuum pressure, 
we produce it uh, uh, fullerenes and we need large amount of solvent which are the resources that we need to dissolve C60 dissolve fullerenes in those materials and then purify more in the next steps to have a, a different type of fullerenes. I think that soccer ball reference is actually great for helping people understand what a fullerene is because uh, 60 carbon atoms is a lot of carbon. And in a spherical sense, I can imagine it. It is interesting to note that it's a 3D appearance instead of like a two-dimensional shape, which is what I was thinking when I heard ring. So thanks for the clarification. You had also mentioned how it can maybe get stuck in the biological tissues. Does your research focus on how it actually affects like the body or is there research done on the toxicity about fullerenes? Fullerenes, yes, there are, there are some studies about the toxicity of the fullerenes and they showed that fullerenes are not toxic to the animals, but at some level they can cause toxicity. For example, if they are into the uh, body in a large amount, fullerenes can be activated under a uh, light and then cause a toxicity that can kill the cancer cells. But in your thesis project, you're interested in understanding how you can optimize the production of these fullerenes for uh, manufacturing commercial uses. Uh, is there anything that you found that is beneficial to increasing the production value of these fullerenes? Yes, uh, as I said, uh, we, re we use large amount of solvent which are toxic during the period, during the process. So we are using some tools like uh, green chemistry concept, which is uh, green chemistry concept, and also uh, another tool that we call it life cycle assessment. We are using these two tools to modify the process and mitigate the environmental impact of the final product. And what is green chemistry? Green chemistry is a new concept that uh, uh, show us how we can modify the process, how m we can mitigate the environmental impact of a product during the process instead of uh, finding problem at the end of the uh, process when they are released to the environment. So instead of cleaning the environment after releasing these toxic uh, materials to the environment, we can modify the process and, uh, for example, select the uh, uh, alternative uh, materials with less toxicity. I love the green chemistry approach. Go green. You had also mentioned that you take a social approach to your research as well. Can you please elaborate a little bit more about that? Yes. Uh, as I said, life cycle assessment is a main approach in for modify, modifying this process. In one, as, in one uh, part of the life cycle assessment, which is from the beginning of the pre using precursors to the releasing to the environment and use phase, uh, specifically for the use phase, we can uh, use social parameters as input the, in that model and see how people react to the different uh, policy, different product, and different approach for cleaning the environment. Thanks for that explanation. For our listeners that are now tuning in, to sum up what Sayed has been saying, is that he is studying fullerenes, and fullerenes are a nanotechnology that can be used in multiple applications. For example, they can be used in drug delivery, in cancer technology, in MRI, and much more. Some people even consume them as supplements. Syed also mentioned that his research with fullerenes focuses on reducing the amount of solvent, which is the substance that is needed to help create the fullerenes, because the substance itself is toxic to the environment. By reducing this, by reducing this solvent, it is a more green approach that they can take towards producing these fullerenes, which are very important towards our everyday lives and towards medical technology and other technologies as well. As I said before, the products that are needed to go into it is toxic, and the waste would be toxic as well. Syed, what do you all do with the waste to dispose of it? Yes, some part of those toxic waste 
can be reused during the process. And that's why I was I said that life cycle assessment can help us because we can look at the process in a bigger picture. So we can reuse, we can modify the process in a way that we can reuse some part of those toxic solvent again in the process. And some part of them, uh, some part of them uh, can be released to the environment, but with a more dilution. You mentioned how some of the waste is released to the environment after it's been diluted a couple of times. What happens to the rest of the waste that's used and created from this fullerene production? For the, for the waste, and most of the waste come from the, uh, let's say, sol solvent, toxic solvents. But uh, the way that we look at the process is uh, using life cycle assessment, which means that we are looking for an alternative non-toxic solvent to use it instead of toxic solvent. Then we, are not, then we don't need to worry about the, the toxic waste. We can only uh, reuse the solvents, I mean alternative solvents, uh, again and again without uh, causing problem to the environment. That's pretty cool. I was wondering, do you have any other research projects that you're involved with? I'm involved in another project, which is about how we can produce energy from municipal waste. In wastewater treatment plant, we have waste that can produce methane without oxygen. And we can use that methane to produce energy from that power plant, or we can use it in in other type of energy. Well, that's good news for your research project is that people are always using the bathroom, so you'll have a constant stream of waste that's gonna always go into that municipal waste treatment plant. So that's really good, at least. So you're using the methane gas to create energy. Are you converting the methane gas to, any, to anything, or is it just methane gas? And how efficient would this be? Like, how much energy are you getting out of this? Yes, we can use that uh, methane for producing energy and, uh, and we can also sell methane to the uh, methane buyers so directly without converting to the energy. The amount of energy that we get from methane production can go back to the treatment process and can uh, supply the en required energy for treating water from the beginning to the end in wastewater treatment plant. Thanks for telling us about your research. It's really incredible, and it's nice that you have all of these different things that you're investigating with these different projects, whether it's the production of fullerene and optimizing it or understanding how methane could be used in biofuels and how they could be extracted from waste. As an MSU graduate student, there's a lot of ways to be involved on campus and within the community. Have you participated in any of these various outreach projects? Yes, I was involving in a research activity in a last summer, and it was a K-12 program, which we, which researchers and uh, mostly graduate students can show their research to the uh, students. Fullerenes are used uh, in a solar cells, and what I introduced uh, to the to those students was uh, how to how to use solar cells and how they need to they calculate the right angle of the uh, sun to get the highest efficiency from the solar cells. With the assistance of the fullerenes? Yes. And how did these kids react to you showing them these this kind of your research? Yes, they were so excited and they worked with the solar cells. They used calculator and also the very technical applications to calculate the right angle of the sun. And when they saw the results, they knew how to uh, change the direction of their solar cells if they have it at home. Well, it sounds like you've made a really large impact in the lives of these children that you went to go visit this past summer. Thank you so much for coming in today to talk to us about your research and your outreach activities within the local community. Thanks for having me. Thank you to all of our listeners that joined us this week. And remember, the truth is in the science. Any comments and questions can be directed to scifiles at impact89fm.org. We'll see you all next week on SciFiles.